This is Radio EcoShock with Alex Smith. What if great masses of clouds disappear as the world warms? Without their shade, planet Earth could get 8 degrees C hotter or 14 degrees Fahrenheit of additional heat. That, I think, would be game over for life as we know it. It sounds like science fiction, but new science says it could be possible. This comes from an award-winning scientist. Dr. Tapio Schneider is a professor of environmental science and engineering at California Institute of Technology and senior research scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. His paper, Possible Climate Transitions from Breakup of Stratocumulus Decks, under greenhouse warming, was published in the journal Nature on February 25, 2019. Tapio Schneider, welcome to Radio EcoShock. Thanks for having me. Is it fair to say you discovered an atmospheric breaking point where greenhouse gases can prohibit the formation of the most dominant type of cloud on Earth? Yes, at least we showed that this is possible, and this is about stratocumulus clouds, primarily in the subtropics, so doesn't mean that clouds everywhere would disappear, but one very common cloud type in the subtropics may be replaced by cumulus clouds, more scattered, um, these typical tropical postcard clouds. And are those stratocumulus clouds prevalent enough that it would make a real difference to Earth's heat budget if they were not there in the subtropics? Yes, these clouds make a huge difference to Earth's energy balance. So they reflect sunlight, they shade the Earth, and thereby exert a cooling effect in the subtropics that then is communicated to the rest of the globe through energy transport. It has long been recognized that they're enormously important for Earth, regulating Earth temperature, Earth energy balance. And for the rest of us, if we're staring out at the sky, what would we see when we're looking at stratocumulus clouds? It's just a white blanket on the sky, and people... For example, where I live uh, in California, are very familiar with it. It's a marine layer that sometimes comes over, over land in uh, May and June in particular. But you see the same clouds in mid-latitudes. Uh, they're very common. And you describe in your paper the mechanics behind the formation of stratocumulus clouds, but it seems a little complicated for the average person. How would you explain that thermal radiation mechanism to a 10-year-old? Well, let me try. I have a nine-year-old at home. I haven't tried to explain that to him yet. But So the key is that these clouds are rather special in how this, the turbulence that sustains them is driven. Many clouds are driven by warming from below. So the sun heats the surface and air masses rise. Moist air masses rise. As they rise, they cool. And at some point, the water and it condenses and forms a cloud. That's, for example, how cumulus clouds in the tropics work. Stratocumulus clouds are a little different. For any cloud to form, you need to have air masses rising, and as they rise, they cool, and then at some point, water condenses. But the air masses rising under the stratocumulus clouds, that rising is actually driven by cooling in the clouds themselves. So the clouds themselves cool, and then the cooler air masses sink to the bottom and come back up as moist air masses that then nourish the clouds. And the cooling in the clouds happens because effectively the clouds radiate heat upwards at the cloud tops, and that cools them. It's like a yeah, like a radiator fin in, in a car, for example. And that cooling becomes less efficient as more greenhouse gases accumulate in the atmosphere above them. They basically can't cool themselves as well anymore. It's much like you know, Earth's surface cools itself by radiating heat upwards, and um, so that's how For example, nights in the desert become relatively cool. And if there's a cloud over a desert and the night is warmer because the surface can't radiate heat upward as effectively anymore and uh, can't cool itself as effectively anymore. It's essentially the same for the clouds. So the cloud tops can't cool as effectively anymore when there are more greenhouse gases above them. All right, so let's picture a warmer atmosphere later on in this century or in the next And there's more carbon dioxide up there in parts per million. There's more methane in parts per billion. There's nitrous oxide. How do these greenhouse gases interfere with the formation of stratocumulus clouds? So these gases make it harder for the clouds to cool themselves at their tops. And the cooling is what propels air masses down towards the surface where they pick up moisture, come back up as moist air masses that sustain the clouds. 
And if the cooling gets so inefficient that these air masses are no longer propelled all the way to the surface, and then they can't pick up moisture at the ocean surface, then the clouds just break up. They break up into these cumulus clouds that are more scattered and uh, were driven by, by heating from below rather than cooling from above. Discovering a kind of doom limit for greenhouse gas levels seems pretty darn important. Tapio Schneider, why did we not know this limit was there before? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, all the ingredients, the mechanisms we are talking about, they're all well known. We didn't discover them. The key mechanisms have been known for at least 20 years. But I think the piece that we contributed is, is explaining how what happens when the cloud scale mechanisms can interact with a surface that changes. So the key new thing is that as cloud cover diminishes, there is more sunlight hitting the surface, more sunlight being absorbed at the surface, and the surface heats. And as the surface heats, that in turn leads to more water vapor in the atmosphere, and water vapor itself is a greenhouse gas, which works against the existence of the cloud. So there's a feedback loop there of cloud cover being diminished, surface warming, leading to further reduced cloud cover. And that feedback loop, while with hindsight it seems obvious it's there, but that had not been explained before. That was the new piece. But I think it could have been discovered earlier. Do current climate models produce cloud levels that match what satellites actually observe? Unfortunately not, especially for the stratocumulus clouds. It's a well-known problem for climate modeling. They're, they're very challenging to model because the scales of the turbulence that sustains them is quite small. It's just meters to tens of meters that matter here. And climate models can only resolve motions of tens of kilometers or so. So climate models cannot resolve these clouds. They're represented in semi-empirical fashions by linking cloud cover to temperature, humidity, and the like in the atmosphere. But this is notoriously inaccurate. So climate models generally strongly underestimate the prevalence of stratocumulus clouds, often by a factor of two or three in the subtropics. Does this flaw in climate models suggest that predictions made by agencies like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change may be off? Well, they're uncertain, and the IPCC is very open about it. It's clearly disclosed in, in, in the IPCC reports that the confidence in anything involving cloud cover, cloud cover changes is low. They stated expressly, and it's, it's a well-known limitation of climate models and climate predictions. They may be off in a sense that maybe even the mean is different or the most likely value is different from what the IPCC report stated. There's a new IPCC report coming up in a few years. We'll see how these estimates will be revised. But there's a problem still with future modelers using what you have learned because you say we've reached some sort of limit of computing power. Well, I think climate models can be improved given the computing power we have, and that's something we're we are working on actively as a multi-institutional group called the Climate Modeling Alliance that has set itself the goal to make climate models, and including these cloud processes, much better. I think it can be done. It, it requires innovation. It requires effort, but, but it's, I think it's very possible. I hope within five years we'll have more accurate, more precise predictions of climate changes, cloud cover changes, and in particular that we have better ways of quantifying the uncertainties in, in those changes, which right now is difficult. All that being said, I mean, you, you mentioned the tipping point in the clouds. I think it's important to keep in mind that this is, it would be very, very far away to occur on Earth. I mean, the, the minimum CO2 concentration that we saw where this was happening was 1,200 ppm, and it might be a good bit larger. We won't see this for at least a century, and I, I don't think we'll ever see CO2 concentrations this high. Well, right. We don't want to overreact to this discovery. I mean, before we reach 1,200 parts per million carbon in the atmosphere, maybe industrial civilization will collapse. Maybe we'll run out of fossil fuels or heaven knows. Maybe we'll come to our senses and change our energy and lifestyles. I guess you have to offer that caution a lot. Right. Or I think to me, the most plausible scenario simply is that uh, clever people will figure out how to produce electricity from sunlight cheaply, and um, that will replace burning of fossil fuels largely. And we'll just find better ways of having a, a good lifestyle without emitting carbon. Let's talk about the things everybody wants to know a little bit more, and that is about the limit of the amount of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases we can add to the atmosphere before we hit this cloud-making barrier and 
and maybe, if that should ever happen, suffer extreme warming. How certain are you about the limit and, and how much latitude is there either side of around 1,200 parts per million? So that number is very uncertain. I think we can be relatively clear what happens when you use, use these stratocumulus clouds to get these about 8 degrees centigrade warming. That's basic energy balance. That part is reasonably clear. There's some uncertainty about the number, but I don't think that's enormous. But the CO2 limit where that happens is, is very uncertain. So 1,200 ppm is the threshold we got when the atmospheric circulation didn't change in our simulations. But the atmospheric circulation, of course, will change as uh, climate warms. And some of the ways in which it changes, we understand. And when we include some of the changes that we understand in, in the simulations, then the limit where these clouds broke up moved to higher CO2 levels. So depending what you assume there was up to around 2,000 ppm. And so that number we cannot, we cannot pinpoint with precision. And it, it may also not be a cliff that, say, there's... 1,500 or whatever the right number is in the end, where, where everything suddenly changes. I think there will be, if this limit would be reached, there would be changes over some time that in some regions these clouds disappear, maybe destabilize neighboring regions, and maybe first it happens seasonally and not year-round and the like. So there would be spatial and temporal variations in the climate system that probably would smooth this out a bit. All of these things we, we cannot make firm statements about on, on the basis of the calculations we did. What I hope to be able to do is what we did to simulate a relatively small patch of stratocumulus clouds, and what we're currently working on is embed many, many such patches in a climate model that we can capture some of these uh, effects of heterogeneity and get better estimates of how the instability interacts with the atmospheric circulation. How can your new theory help us understand what may have happened in previous episodes of abrupt warming in our planet's history? Right. I think that's one of the most interesting questions to me. Um, we know firmly now that there have been rapid and large climate changes in the geological past. 50 million years ago, Earth was much, much warmer than it is now, maybe something like 12 degrees centigrade warmer. don't know precisely how much warmer, but we do know that there were crocodiles living in, in, in polar latitudes or palm trees in very high latitudes. We just have fossil evidence of that. And it seems also pretty clear that the CO2 concentration at the time was high, but not enormously high, so it seems pretty clear it was below 2,000 parts per million. And if you take current climate models, for example, Matt Huber at uh, Purdue University has done that and increases CO2 concentrations in those models by a lot, you don't get a climate that's warm enough, as in it's consistent with the geological record, at CO2 concentrations below, say, 2,000 parts per million. What Matt had to do is increase CO2 concentrations to more than 4,000 parts per million to get a climate that's consistent with the uh, geological records we have of what climate was like at the time. And CO2 levels that high, the people who work on this say they can be ruled out. So there, there's a bit of a mystery here. Is how can climate, how could climate have been so warm as it seems it was without CO2 concentrations having been enormously high? And I think strong cloud feedbacks are a likely culprit just because we don't understand clouds very well, and climate models don't do well in simulating them. And the mechanism we describe is, is, is one possibility of how you can get to very warm climates without excessive CO2 concentrations. In general, I would say the, the record of climates of the past is, is one of large swings over geological timescales that we do not understand well. And I think it's, uh, it, it asks us to be cautious with perturbing a system whose understanding is incomplete. Check out the Radio EcoShock website. We're at ecoshock.org. You are listening to Radio EcoShock. I'm Alex Smith. My guest is climate expert Tapio Schneider from Caltech and NASA. We're talking about a dangerous limit in atmospheric carbon dioxide that could prevent the formation of key clouds that currently cool the Earth. In discussing your paper, you give the analogy of scientists with simple models discovering the runaway greenhouse effect, which may have occurred on the planet Venus. I remember James Hansen discussing that. That's a pretty unsettling example. How does it apply to your work, and are you suggesting this cloud shift could trigger a runaway greenhouse scenario? No, 
No, the runaway greenhouse, the best evidence we have right now is that it cannot occur on Earth. Um, Earth, Earth is just far enough away from the sun that that probably can be ruled out. What I think in the discussion, the point I wanted to make is that the models for a runaway greenhouse effect we have are relatively simple. They're often one-dimensional models of the atmosphere, and yet they illustrate the key mechanisms, which are not in dispute. I think it's no longer seriously disputed that a runaway greenhouse can occur, and it's, the evidence is strong that it did, in fact, occur on, on Venus. Um, and I was just drawing an analogy to our work. There's, there's a bit of a runaway effect of the clouds, the stratocumulus clouds disappearing, and we describe the mechanisms on the basis of a simplified model that, however, illustrates the key mechanisms, the key physics involved. So what you cannot do with sim simplified models is be quantitatively precise, for example, about the CO2, CO2 level when these, these clouds break up. We, we can't be very precise about it. But nonetheless, what we can do is say, here are the physical mechanisms. It's quite possible that this instability occurs. And I think that's analogous to the runaway greenhouse effect. These simple models exposed the mechanisms that made it clear that it's possible that uh, this runaway greenhouse effect can occur. And for Venus, there's evidence, say, from the isotopic composition um, of the atmosphere, for example, that says it probably did occur there. But this cloud greenhouse problem is an example of a nonlinear feedback process? Right. It is, it is a nonlinear feedback process in much the way that the runaway greenhouse effect is a nonlinear feedback process. But what runs away in our case is just a subtropical cloud cover. It's not the entire... It's not, not the ocean starting to boil off as in a runaway greenhouse effect presumably occurred on Venus. And you did try to chart the way back, like at what point could you go below that limit and expect the clouds to reform again? I, I, I was wondering why you would bother to do that, because if, if we did go up 8 degrees C or, or more, uh, there may not be any of us here to worry about it. But, but you did try to do that calculation, and, and what did you find? Well, when, when you reduce CO2 concentrations, the clouds do not immediately reform at the threshold at which they broke up. So you need to, in some calculations, say where they broke up at 1,200 ppm or 1,300 ppm, you needed to go back to 300 or 200 ppm CO2 before the clouds reformed. The motivation for doing that was not to make statements about the future. And, and in general, that wasn't the motivation for the paper. We were not trying to say that this will happen. You're just trying to say, here's a feedback that can possibly happen and may have happened, may have occurred in Earth's past. And this going back to lower CO2 is relevant if you want to understand Earth's past, right? We had episodes of high CO2 concentrations. So, for example, the Paleocene, Eocene thermal maximum, generally the early Eocene, but then the greenhouse gas concentrations steadily dropped for millions of years. And uh, if you are in one of these hothouse climate worlds where, say, Presumably, you didn't have these stratocumulus clouds, or very few of them. But then, for geological reasons, uh, increased weathering and the like, CO2 levels drop. The results show at, at some point these clouds can reform, and maybe at some point even quite quite suddenly, leading to quite suddenly in, in geological times, leading to, in that case, a considerably cooler climate. And again, the geological record is, is full of transitions between warmer and cooler climates that seem to happen relatively rapidly in, in, in geological timescales, and, and that's where I think our results may help offer an explanation. I'm trying to straighten out my own mind. If Earth loses the mass of cooling provided by stratocumulus clouds, is the resulting 8 degrees C or 14 degrees Fahrenheit that you suggested, is that added to the temperatures that might already be in a much hotter world? For example, if we reach 6 degrees C at 1,200 parts per million, does Earth then go to a steaming 14 degrees C without those clouds? Yes, that's, that's the implication. The 8 degrees that we estimated is really just from the instability of the clouds. and That's on top of whatever greenhouse warming you had before you get to that. And your paper suggests without the clouds, the subtropics get even hotter than that, going 10 degrees C warmer. That's terrible news for South Australia, North Africa, South China, Middle East, the U.S. South, Mexico, parts of South America. Why do the subtropics get even hotter rather than an evenly distributed heat over the globe? So the clouds on which we focus are subtropical stratocumulus clouds. So if you lose them in the subtropics, and of course the subtropics warm first and warm most, 
the extra heat accumulating in the subtropics is then transported to other parts of the globe and, and warm the rest of the globe. And that's, that's why it's more in the subtropics than elsewhere. I've seen estimates from Caltech and other places that our current rate of emissions growth, if we go business as usual, we could reach 1,200 parts per million CO2 sometime in the next century. To me, that doesn't seem that far away. It's a few generations uh, until possible cloud doom. Uh, what makes you so optimistic that we're not going to get there? Various reasons, but I think the, the important thing to keep in mind is that even before you would see any such breakup of stratocumulus clouds, climate change would have severe adverse effects from the warming that you mentioned, leading to extreme precipitation and the like. I think people are clearly starting to see that some of that is already happening, and I think it's uh, spurring people into action, and it's, it's, it's fostering innovation. For example, the ways in which we produce energy, and I think the, what makes me reasonably optimistic is that I think we have a history of underestimating technological progress, and the progress in, for example, solar power is, is quite enormous the last 20 years. The cost of solar power has decreased so much that it's not far away anymore. To the cost of producing electricity from solar power is not that far from the cost of electricity production from coal burning, for example. And once these two cost curves cross, um, you get exponential transformation of entire industries and reductions in carbon emissions. In many countries, it's already cheaper to install a new solar power plant than building a new coal power plant. And, uh, I think we'll see more of that. And 1,200 ppm and higher is so far out that I think that the technological transition will happen before we get there. Previous to your new research, other scientists suggested creating more clouds, either by spraying seawater from ships or spraying sulfates from airplanes. What do you think of that geoengineering, and could it replace the shade currently provided by stratocumulus clouds if we needed to? The evidence is mixed how well that works. I mean, the geoengineering part that I think is possible is to put aerosols, for example, sulfates into the stratosphere. That's feasible. That's, there's maybe a possible stopgap measure to prevent some warming for some time. Seeding clouds in the subtropics, it is not clear how effective that will be. be. I think it raises interesting questions scientifically. I mean, the, the issue here is that the microphysics of droplet formation and the like in the clouds is not as well understood as we would like it to be. And it's important that we understand that better so that we can model these clouds better. So one way of viewing the experiments you do to test what the effect of seeding is on these clouds is just in purely scientific terms of what is the effect of aerosols, cloud condensation nuclei on the optical properties of the clouds, which is something we need to know to make better climate models. And I hope we'll, we'll see more research that addresses those questions. Tapio, I think we need a name for this newly found limit to clouds. I might suggest the cloud barrier, but what do you call it? didn't even think about a name. If you have no name. Yeah. <laughs> well, then you're going to leave it up to bloggers. Yeah, we, we, I mean, when we talked about the work while we were doing it, we, we always talked about the threshold where the breakup occurs or the transition stratocumulus to cumulus. In a way, the, the transition from stratocumulus to cumulus occurs naturally right now, right? If you go, um, if you go westward, say, from, from California, you fly first over stratocumulus decks that then give way to cumulus, and there's a very similar transition occurring naturally in space, I think, could then occur in, in, in time as, as greenhouse gases increase. And that's just called the stratocumulus-cumulus transition. So I think we used the term transition. We talked about it because of that. I think a name could be important, and I think it's important that policymakers, for example, know that there is a barrier out there, because I've heard some pretty wild things from, mainly from industry usually, but, oh, no problem, we'll go to a 1,000 parts per million, it's been like that in the past, or we'll go to 1,500, it's been like that in the past, and, and your study says, no, there's a real big danger out there, it's far out there, but it is there, and I think it's important for people to know that. Yeah, I mean... I think it would be hard to get policymakers to think of timescales of hundreds or hundreds of years. I think we'll probably need to focus on the more shorter-term impacts that are more certain. Okay. And what are the big questions, as we wrap up here, what are the big questions in atmospheric science that you would like to work on? In general, how clouds respond to climate change, not just stratocumulus, but other types of clouds as well, is probably the most important question we need to answer to get better climate predictions. And uh, I and several others are working on it intensely. There are other questions. We talked about 
climate changes in the, in the more distant past, ice age cycles, the, the cyclic variations between ice ages and warmer periods, we do not fully understand. Their greenhouse gas concentrations change along with temperature, but there's clearly a feedback not only from greenhouse gas concentrations on temperature, but also the other way around. The temperature affects greenhouse gas concentration in some fashion through biological processes, most likely. And those processes we also need to understand better. It relates to the question where a lot of the carbon that we are emitting is going right now. Only about half the carbon dioxide that's being emitted is accumulating in the atmosphere. The other half is taken up by oceans and by the land. And it's not quite clear where and how. It's clearly important to understand that if you want to predict our climate future, say if the, this carbon sink soaks up about half the carbon that's being emitted, if that changes, if it becomes less effective, more carbon would end up in the atmosphere, we would get more severe climate change. And we don't understand that very well either. I think that's another important question. In general, I would say, I mean, the, the climate sciences are a great area to work in because there are so many really fundamental questions that are still open and that are calling for an answer. And it's a uh, it's a really good area for young scientists to get involved in because you're in the process of discovering how the system works, and it's, uh, it's important and interesting to be part of that discovery. We have been speaking with Dr. Tapio Schneider, professor at California Institute of Technology and senior research scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. You can find links to his new paper, Possible Climate Transitions from Breakup of Stratocumulus Decks Under Greenhouse Warming, in my weekly show blog at ecoshock.org. Tapio, thank you so much for sharing your valuable work with us. Exactly. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. It was nice talking with you. We were very well prepared. I'm Alex Smith for Radio Ecoshock. You're listening to Ecoshock Radio for the world. I'm Alex Smith. Get it all at our website, ecoshock.org.